But the thing is, is that, you know, over the years we get called a lot of names, but one of the things they began to call us were pirates. And I said, well, I don't have any problem with that. We adopted our own Jolly Roger. And uh, because if you go back to the 17th century, piracy in the Caribbean, out of control, flourishing, despite the efforts of the British Navy. Why? Because so many British politicians and military people were on the take. Piracy flourished because a lot of people made money out of it. Piracy was finally ended in the Caribbean because of one man, Henry Morgan, a pirate. If you want to stop pirates, you need pirates to do it. So we look on ourselves as pirates of compassion and pursuit of pirates of, of greed. And throughout the history, uh, there's been very a lot of uh, noble pirates. Uh, Sir Francis Drake or Walter Raleigh, John Paul Jones, all were pirates. So we're in good company, we think, and uh, we're going to continue to do what we do because in opposing these criminal operations, we're opposing uh, the real pirates, and we, uh, I think that we're protected legally by the very fact that we're simply acting in accordance to international law. And if they don't like it, they can arrest us, which by the, by the way, they have done on some occasions. I was arrested in 93 for chasing the Spanish and Cuban drag trawler fleets off of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. Canada charged me with three counts of mischief. Doesn't sound like anything, but you know, usually when they can't get you on anything, it's either conspiracy or mischief. And in this case, I was facing two times life plus ten, because Canada, a mischief endangering life is a, is life uh, imprisonment, and mischief endangering property is ten years. I'm on trial the same time as O.J. Simpson. He's facing a mere two times life for murder. I'm facing two times life for saving fish. And it was a great trial, I had a good time. It was about four and a half weeks of the trial and 45 government witnesses, and I was the only witness to the defense. But it gave us an opportunity to present the UN World Charter for Nature as our defense. And so my lawyer got up before the jury in Newfoundland, a place where everybody hates me anyway because of our opposition to the seal hunt, and the government thought it was a slam dunk that they would uh, win this case. And uh, our lawyer went up to the jury and says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're not going to say we didn't do what we're charged with. We're going to say we did exactly what we were charged with. We're proud to have done it, and we intend to do it again. That was our opening defense, and we won the case. <laughs> The reason being was the UN World Charter for Nature. Now Canada had brought in a law professor to argue that the UN Charter for Nature had no application in the Canadian legal system. And the judge said, well, did Canada sign this? And her answer was, well, yes, but Canada signs a lot of things. <laughs> so uh, the judge said, well, if Canada signed it, I'm going to have to get the jury to take it into consideration. So I was acquitted on what was called color of right, that I believe that I was acting in accordance to the law and also the Minister of Fisheries in Canada helped me quite considerably because when I left uh, Halifax uh, to go and prote uh, protect the, uh, the cod, his exact words were, well, I wish him luck. Of course, translated in plain paper, I wish him luck. In other words, we had the endorsement of the Minister of Fisheries. <laughs> so that helped considerably. But we have found over the years that to do what we do, we have to have a good understanding of international and environmental law, and uh, we have to make sure that we walk that thin line to stay on the right side of it so that we, uh, you know, so we stay out of jail. Uh, but the other thing, too, we have to worry about is uh, to make sure that nobody's been hurt. And uh, in 32 years of doing what we've been doing, we've never injured anybody, and we've never had anybody seriously injured on our vessels, which is an unblemished record that we're really quite proud of. But we have to come up with a lot of imaginative uh, sort of tactics. What you saw them hurling on board the uh, deck of the, uh, of the whaling vessels are bottles of rotten butter. Uh, it smells horrible. It's pretty hard to work in the conditions after your deck's been doused with rotten butter. It's sort of like really uh, aging vomit. And uh, then we also hit them with packets of methyl cellulose, which makes everything slippery. So we just make the deck slippery and, and smelly. And um, we've also used in the past, we've hit them with uh, pie filling, which we fire from cannons. So we were able to slime them sometimes with 45 gallon shots of chocolate or cream pie. <laughs> and these are effective deterrents, but they don't hurt anybody and they contain an element of humor and uh, that helps us quite considerably. Right now, uh, this last year, uh, for the first time, we started our own television series on Animal Planet and Discovery called Whale Wars. 
and that's been very effective. In fact, uh, the showing of Animal Planet in November and December in the U.S. and Canada, it is now the highest rated Animal Planet show ever produced, and it will air here on Discovery in Britain beginning uh, dis the end of uh, April. So uh, we just completed our second year of that, which will be much more dramatic, and that'll begin to air in the U.S. market in, uh, in June. And it's now airing in Latin America. But most importantly, Discovery looks like they're going to have it aired in Japan. And uh, this is, and I'm getting the impression the Japanese are far more afraid of, uh, of the Whale Wars series than they are of us, because now it's exposing their, you know, their criminal activities to a much, much wider audience. And uh, they're getting increasingly upset and frustrated about the whole thing. But the fact is, is that what they're doing is completely and totally illegal. We're involved with many other issues. We're working in partnership with the uh, Galapagos Park uh, Rangers and the Ecuadorian National Police to try and intervene against poaching operations uh, in uh, Galapagos and Ecuador. And we've been there nine years now. It's been very successful. Uh, for those of you who have uh, gone diving in the Galapagos, you would probably be familiar with the problems that we have here. About 300,000 sharks a year are taken illegally out of the out of the National Park Marine Reserve, which is also a World Heritage Site. And uh, we provided a patrol vessel for the National Park. We helped deploy a barge just uh, a couple of months ago to Wolf and Darwin, which now means there's 24-hour surveillance there. And uh, that has cut down poaching considerably because those islands are so remote. And uh, so no poaching takes place as long as we have the rangers in position there. And uh, just two weeks ago, we deployed for the first time our own canine units in Ecuador. These are dogs that are specially trained to sniff out shark fins and sea cucumbers at ports and airports. And we have our own network of informants. And uh, some of the people working with us are former federal uh, enforcement agents with the Environmental Protection Agency or National Marine Fisheries in the United States who have retired and now come to work with us as volunteers and they're helping us down there to uh, train the rangers into proper uh, uh, policing techniques in order to uh, catch these poaching operations. Uh, the poaching of uh, shark fins there and the market in shark fins is a major, major criminal activity ranking only third after drugs and weapons as uh, on the black market. And it's estimated about 75 to 90 million sharks are being uh, killed every year just for their fins to provide uh, that uh, market in, uh, in China primarily. So we're trying to hit it at the source. Other organizations like Wild Aid are trying to uh, stop it at the market in China. You know, we're recruiting people like Jackie Chan to do commercials and things in China to try and discourage the consumption of, uh, of shark fins. One of the things that we can do everywhere else is if you uh, know of a Chinese restaurant that's serving shark fin, you know, just get your friends together, make a reservation. The more exclusive the restaurant, the better it works. Make a reservation, go in there, 10, 12 people, sit down. First question, do you have any shark fin soup? Of course, they'll say yes, and they say, oh, sorry, you can't go and walk out right on it. If enough people do that, I think they'll get the, <laughs> get the message. Because if we lose the sharks, we're going to be in some serious, uh, have some very, very serious uh, problems. We uh, helped uh, make the film Sharkwater, which some people might have uh, seen with uh, Rob Stewart. And uh, that, that has uh, had a considerable acclaim in, uh, uh, internationally, and I think has helped to change people's attitudes. The, you know, the reality of it is, is that uh, sharks have been made into monsters by uh, Hollywood primarily, but uh, more people are killed every year playing golf than divers are killed by sharks because it's much more dangerous to play golf because more people are struck by lightning on golf courses and are attacked by sharks in the wild. In fact, uh, usually, uh, I think the average number of people killed by sharks every year is five. Uh, when you compare that to the average number of people killed by ostriches every year, which is 100, that makes the ostrich uh, 20 times more dangerous than the shark. And uh, actually, the average number of people killed every year by soda pop machines falling on them is nine. <laughs> so it's seriously overrated. And it's amazing they don't attack more people, considering how much we look like seals from the surface, and uh, they do prey upon seals. Uh, just uh, two months ago, a little 15-year-old girl in Tasmania was attacked by a great white, and uh, we gave her a medal for courage because even though she was still bleeding, the first thing she says is, don't harm the shark. The shark did nothing wrong. And so we gave her a medal for courage on that, and uh, you know she's, had, she's uh, recovered. But uh, this is the kind of attitude that we're trying to encourage, that if you go into the habitat of these animals, you know, you can't blame them if you're being attacked. And in fact, a friend of mine once wrote a paper called The Importance of Great Big Fierce Animals That Can Eat You. And the importance is, is it restores a little bit of hum much needed humility to us. 
the fact is that we can't continue to be the, you know, the great destroyers going across the planet, killing everything on sight. And uh, we have to learn to live in harmony with other creatures. You know, I uh, was debating a Norwegian whaler one time who got upset with me because he said, but Watson, you say whales are more intelligent than people. This is a very, very silly thing to say. How can you justify that? And I said, well, George, I, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with the natural world. And by that criteria, whales are far more intelligent than we are. And he said, well, well by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. George, you're beginning to understand. What's <laughs>